The Hopkinton Historical Society and Public Library hosted a presentation by Boston Marathon bombing survivor, Roseanne Sedoya. A lot of people ask right off the bat why I chose to do the book. There's several reasons why, one being that for me, I, I realized early on that doing the interviews on the, the TV stations and the newspapers, for me, it was very therapeutic because I'm not sure if anybody in this room could ever m realize the words that came out that I've been blown up, I've been in a terrorist attack. As a matter of fact, I had gone back to work for six months and in the hallway I was talking to one of my former coworkers and he, he made this comment that I was now part of history. Roseanne talked about the struggles of overcoming losing one of her legs from the bombing and talked about her life previously and currently. Important things for me was early on when a lot of other organizations came, such as we had several military groups, um, Semper Fi and America's Fund, come and show that even though you lose a leg, two legs, an arm, an eye, fingers, that life goes on and you can still have a good life. And they look normal. When they walked in on those prosthesis, they one guy told me he could hop like he could hop on one leg for like a mile if he needed to, which I don't advise. I heard that's bad. Uh, so, but it w it was truly encouraging to see them, and it was extremely healing. She also read passages from her book entitled "Perfect Strangers: Friendship, Strength, and Recovery After Boston's Worst Day." Without any further ado, I, I ask you to welcome Roseanne to Hopkinton, and I know that after she uh, presents us with some of her book, she will take some questions and answers, and the book is for sale, and she will be signing. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, first off, thank you for having me here. I think this is my first time ever in Hopkinton. Although I thought maybe I'd be here for a different reason, starting the marathon at one point in life, but we'll, we're not so sure that will happen going forward, but who knows? Weirder things have happened, right? So, um, so thank you for having me. Uh, the Historical Center, this building is amazing. It's truly amazing, and Anne, thank you for all your support over the last couple of years. Uh, ironically, I was also, I, I knew Heather before the bombings as well. We were friends through mutual friends. She lives in Newport, and, uh, I did not realize, I, I was shocked when I saw our uh, common friends from Newport coming to visit me. I thought that was really strange. that They would make that whole way, make that long ride up to Boston from Newport, Rhode Island to visit little old me. Little did I know that they had been visiting Heather too. So <laughs> yeah, when I came to from like all the medications and everything, I'm like, that makes sense now. <laughs> but uh, so what I'd like to do and the way I've been doing these I'm new to this whole forum situation, so bear with me. But I'd like to talk a little bit about why I wrote the book, and then do a little bit of reading from the book, and then uh, talk about the chapter, the, the part of it that I read, and then do some Q&A. So, um, you know, and I'm an open, no, ton, no pun intended, but I'm an open book. So <laughs> there's no questions off limit, and I'm more than willing to answer any and all. And if it's something that I don't want to answer, I'll let you know, but nine times out of 10, that has not been, actually, I would say nine and a half times out of 10, that has not been a problem. So uh, what I'd like to start off with is that a lot of people ask right off the bat why I chose to do the book. There's several reasons why, one being that for me, I, I realized early on that doing the interviews on the, the TV stations and the newspapers, for me, it was very therapeutic because I'm not sure if anybody in this room could ever m realize the words that came out that I've been blown up, I've been in a terrorist attack. As a matter of fact, I had gone back to work for six months and in the hallway I was talking to one of my former coworkers and he, he made this comment that I was now part of history. And that's kind of shocking to have someone say that to you, that you are part of history. 
I, I, you know, it stunned me because there's a lot of this that there's so, so many little pieces that you don't really think about. So with part of that and something that Ann Matina had said where they spelled Mike's name incorrectly, with it being part of history, I also wanted to make sure that our story was told and it was told without any sensationalizing through the media. As, as much as the media has been great to me and I appreciate everything they've done, there are points and times that things can be incorrect as we hear about all that fake news these days. Um, so I want to make sure that our story was told the way that we wanted it to be told and told as much as of 100% truth that we could get in here. The ghostwriter, Jen Jordan, uh, is a journalist at heart. She worked at WGBH way back when. She's from Vermont initially, lived in Boston and Cambridge, but lives in Utah now. So we were working with her, and there were times that I would have to kind of reel her back in on some of the, the points that she was trying to drive home. I didn't want it to be something that it was about the bombing because that's not what the point of this book was and still is. The point of this book really is to express uh, our friendship and the good that's come out of it. And whether or not Mike and I had ended up engaged as a couple, I truly believe that the four of us would still have this strong bond amongst the four of us. It's something that really truly brought us together. Another reason why I wrote the book is I think if someone tells you or says it enough, you should write a book, you should write a book, you should write a book, you tend to <laughs> write a book. So uh, we felt as though that it was a good story to tell. If you ask Mike, it's my story, it's not his. But I really think that it's part of all of us and you'll get a good sense of each one of us that uh, are in here. And it's very difficult to Number one, tell a stranger your life. There were a lot of awkward conversations, but maybe it's from the bombing, and I, maybe I'm a little bit stupid sometimes, but I'll tell anybody anything. I really don't care. <laughs> Mike, on the other hand, is completely private, just very shy. He's an introvert, but he's the nicest, nicest guy. So it was definitely difficult for him to do this. There were several times that we would have the edits and we'd have to read through and he'd be like, I never said that. And I'm like, well, you must have said something similar to that because she didn't make it up and it sounds pretty, you know, on, on, in line. But I think in the end, this is a very great representation of who the four of us are. I will also say that if you've read the book or when you read the book, when you read about my mother, She's not sensationalized at all either. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I will tell you, any, I will say what I'm going to say here, and I've said it. She came to a talk that I did in Drake it a, a couple weeks ago, and I, I have no qualms about saying this in front of her or anything along those lines, but basically I had a family member who came to one of my readings, and she had said to me, you know what I really like about this book? And I was like, no, Fran, what? She goes, you didn't sugarcoat your mom. You didn't... Uh, downplay her, that it, it, how you ha portray her in this book, that is really her. And Jen Jordan interviewed my mom on tape. We sat at lunch one day, and Jen Jordan basically has taken everything verbatim from that tape and talking to my mom and has put it in this book. So just so you know, this is her. She's crazy. <laughs> and I guess when I do public speaking, I talk about choices that we have in life. And with her, you can either pretend she's not your mom or accept her. <laughs> so we've gone with the, it's taken me my 40 plus years to accept her, but uh, she, she is a trip. And all my friends are like, oh, we love your mom. And I'm like, that's because she's not your mom. <laughs> so keep that in mind when, when you are reading this. Uh, for my dad, it was very difficult for him. I think that when you read about yourself and when you grow up or when you're raising your kids, everybody has a different perspective. And I think at some point it was hard for him to kind of look at that and say, okay, in, in, in no way is there anything um, that I meant bad by it. And I, I called him a disciplinarian. 
Um, there were some bumps in the road, obviously, growing up as a kid, and he thought that, you know, uh, it didn't happen that way, or however I remembered it, and I was like, well, this book is my book, so if he ever wants to write a book and say how he brought me up, which he did a very fine job and an excellent job, I think, and he was a dis disciplinarian. I mean, you had my mother who's kind of crazy. You needed someone to really kind of keep the kids balanced, and, and that he did. And, you know, we had our chores. We had to mow the lawn, and he wanted me to make sure everybody realizes that it was a ride on lawnmower. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, we had our things to do. We don't have any boys in the family. It's my sister and me. So basically, we were stuck shoveling the driveway. He told me shoveling the driveway builds good character. And I told him I had enough character already. <laughs> so needless to say, that one didn't go over well either. But in doing this book, it's been a crazy journey. It's a weird industry, one that I'm not sure I'll really ever figure out. But it took us about two years to really put this together. So two years of the marathon and talking and people saying you should write a book, and then two years in speaking with the ghostwriter and putting it down on paper and then having her kind of compile the story, us editing it time and time and time and time again, and then it going to the editor, and having the editor really kind of whittle it down so that it wasn't a thousand pages long. My mom, actually, the last time I spoke, several people told me at the last one, I should do a book on my mother alone <laughs> as her side character. And there's been some conversations with different uh, uh, industries, and they're like, your mother is a character. I'm like, yep. So don't be surprised if you don't see a spin-off of her having her own sitcom sometime. <laughs> it, it would be definitely interesting. Uh, so overall, it was a great experience. It was a long one. It was definitely a full-time job, believe it or not, because there were deadlines. And uh, the ghostwriter, Jen Jordan, had her deadline, and she would get it back to me. And I would have my deadline to get it back to her. And then she would have her deadline to get it back to me. And of course, I would send it out to Mike, Shana, and Shores to have them proofread it. And then they had a deadline to get it back to me. And I have to say, they weren't the easiest to um, coordinate in regards to getting their information back. Especially when you don't want to read about yourself, you tend to you know, not read it. And, uh, and then some would read it on their cell phone and just skim over it. And so it is what it is. I think it came out great personally, and uh, I would definitely do it again. So what I'd like to do is read part of uh, a chapter. And the reason why I picked this particular chapter is, as I said, I'm new to this. So when I did my first couple of readings, I didn't know which chapter to pick. So I just started from the beginning. Like, and I, don't, I figured that was a good place to start. But it describes the marathon, it describes being in Boston on that day. And I have to assume, well, I'm assuming you're mostly from Hopkinton, so I have to assume most of you have been to the marathon, whether it's here or, have people been at the finish line in, at the marathon? I would assume, right? So one of the readings I did, uh, a family friend came up to me and said to me that, oh, you described it just as I would have described it, when I, because I've been there. So I figured that doesn't make sense for me to read something that all of you can picture already and, and have experienced it personally. So what I've done is I've, chose, I've chosen mid-book uh, in chapter six. The chapter is called Awake. So I'm gonna read part of that to you. And I, my old age, I have to have the cheaters. <laughs> the first couple I forgot that I needed the cheaters, so I like, really kind of squint and made up my own words. <laughs> I'm learning as I go along. I'm a slow learner, but... Chapter 6, Awake. I was awake. Standing at my bedside were mom, dad, Gia, and a handsome doctor in a white coat. Groggy from the anesthesia and the pain medications, I had no idea it was already Tuesday evening. I had lost, along with most of my blood and the lower half of my right leg, a day and a half of my life. Dad looked like he had aged years. Mom smiled at me with tears and terror in her eyes. I could tell she was dying for a cigarette. Then again, she was always dying for a cigarette. The doctor wore the weary smile of someone who has seen too much. Hi, Roseanne, I'm Dr. King. As freakishly unlucky as I had been to find myself inches away from the bomb, I was incredibly lucky that Dr. David King awaited the victims at, in Mass General Hospital's trauma bay. 
a surgical veteran from, of the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars, as well as the Haitian earthquake relief efforts. Dr. King had been in a cab driving back to his home in Cambridge after running the marathon himself when the first text came into his cell phone. Are you okay? Heard there was an explosion. Bomb at marathon. Have you finished the race? Hope you're safe. Are you still running? King had dropped his wife and two young daughters at home and immediately headed straight to Mass General, less than a mile away across the Charles River. When he pulled up to the ambulance ramp, he almost turned around and went home. Everything looked normal, even quiet. There were no screaming ambulances, no police cruisers, no crush of nurses and doctors at the emergency room doors. But he just had a feeling. With the hair on the back of his neck standing on edge, he thought, what the hell, I'm here, I better go have a look. Even though he had just finished running 26.2 miles in just over three hours, he ran up three flights of stairs to grab his surgical scrub cap and protective operating glasses. No matter what awaited him in the ER, he wanted to be able to get right to work. He hurried back down the stairs to the ER. King didn't, know, <clears throat> excuse me, King didn't yet know what the nature of the explosion had been. Industrial accident, propane tank, gas line. But as soon as he walked through the ER doors and saw the beds crowded with bloody victims, he knew these people have been blown up by an IED. The pattern of a bomb blast is unique, not only to its victims, but to the shape of the blast itself. Essentially, no two bombs are alike, and no two people are injured in the same way. The bombs that took not just my leg, but eventually another 19 legs from 17 other victims were made with the pressure cookers filled with gunpowder, BBs, nails, and screws. Unlike a professionally made bomb with military grade components that explode in a uniform blast, these improvised and amateur bombs explode in a thousand different directions. It was entirely dumb luck that at the scene of the first bomb, Jeff Bowman lost both legs above the knee in a fraction of a second, while a woman to his right suffered only minor hearing damage. In my case, the second bomb, which killed two people less than 10 feet from me, only took my right leg. As the most critically injured in the blast made their way to four closest trauma units in Boston, doctors receiving them knew two things, that they were soon to be overrun with untold numbers of mortally wounded patients, and that the culprit had been some sort of explosion on Boylston Street. For King, once he saw the victims, there was a third realization. Few American doctors have seen the reality of war and its ability to produce hundreds of wounded in an instant. Even fewer, have, even fewer have seen the relatively recent influx of IEDs into everyday battle and the catastrophic damage they inflict on the human body. He was one of the few who had seen both. One of the many mind-numbing realizations that would occur to King in the coming days was that America had just suffered its first major modern terrorist event resulting in mass trauma with warlike lower extremity injuries. Never before had hundreds of Americans been blown up by ground level bombs. This he knew was a devastating milestone in the nation's history. When they moved me into the ER, Francis McNulty, RN, was on duty. Until 3 p.m., his shift in the emergency room had been normal, and about 16 of the trauma bed, beds had, been, had patients awaiting evaluation. Then the ER received a call to expect mass, ca mass casualties. The staff members weren't told what had happened, but were instructed to clear every possible bed for incoming victims. Miraculously, what happened within minutes? That happened within minutes. Wow, I wish we could clear patients that fast every day, McNulty thought. Then all hell broke loose. At 3.04, the first patients arrived. And soon after, the ER became a sea of trauma wounds. As McNulty focused on the first of the injured coming into the emergency department, he heard rather than saw the doors to the trauma bays repeatedly banging open and with them the screams of the wounded. EMS crews hurriedly, rec hurriedly reciting their patient stats and handing them off, and nurses and doctors calling for IVs and x-rays, chest tubes, and tourniquets. In less than 25 minutes, Mass General received 31 victims from the bombing, five of whom would lose their legs. McNulty went as quickly as he could from bed to bed, checking the patient's vitals and trying to get them stable for transport to the operating room. As he did, he appreciated that as ugly and bloody as trauma wounds were, unlike infections or diseases, where an untold number of calamities and dangers lurk just beneath the surface, the initial treatment was simple and straightforward. Stop the bleeding, stabilize the breathing, 
get the patients on a unit of blood, and send them upstairs for surgery. But there was one thing about these patients that wasn't at all routine. McNulty found himself staring at tiny gold nails like the ones you hang pictures with, lying on the sheets next to some of the wounded. Shiny and new looking, they just lay there, not bloody or embedded in arms or legs. McNulty figured they had been intended as shrapnel along with the BBs and screws, but instead had just gotten tangled in the patient's clothing or hair. Unlike the other ingredients in the bombs, these nails had miraculously not done any harm. McNulty looked up from the odd little nails and saw a man in the next bed talking on his cell phone. McNulty was struck by how calm he was, given that one of his legs was all but gone below the knee. McNulty wondered if it could, be, could even be saved. Honey, the man said calmly into the phone, be sure to walk the dog. I won't be home in time to do it. Dude, screw the dog, McNulty thought. Your leg is gone. Realizing that the man was not, calm, was not calm so much as he was in shock, McNulty took the phone from him and said to the woman at the other end, you better get over here. He's not going to die, but he's been injured and you need to come. He stabilized the man's tourniquet and moved on. As he did, he saw a large firefighter in full bunker gear holding an imp improvised tourniquet on a woman's leg and helping push her into the room on a gurney. Bring her over here, McNulty told Mike. As they wheeled me into Trauma Bay 12, McNulty asked Mike what had happened. He was well aware that firefighters usually don't usually have the erroneous task of bringing the mortally wounded into the ER and relaying life and death information to the doctors and nurses. Usually firefighters apply life-saving triage at the scene then hand off the critical care to the ambulance EMTs. But there had been no EMTs in the back of that paddy wagon and Mike did his best to give McNulty every piece of crucial information he could. Ground level blast, right leg severely damaged, improvised tourniquet applied on the street, minor burns to right arm and hand, patient alert and verbal. But other than that, Mike told McNulty, all we could do is scoop and run, sorry. Good enough, man, good job, McNulty told Mike as he instructed an orderly to take control of the tourniquet and began, began assessing my injuries. McNulty looked down at me and saw many things all at once. The inadequate tourniquet, the mess of my right leg in the splint, the burns and shrapnel wounds to my left leg and arms, and that my face was the color of ashes. He immediately went to work, getting me stable for surgery. He never saw the firefighter leave. McNulty says I looked up at him and then, looked up at him then, my eyes full of fear and questions. I don't remember any of it or that I was ever conscious in the ER. Your leg is pretty bad, he told me, experience having taught him that sugarcoating a critical injury is pointless. Shock or no shock, the patients usually know better than anybody how hurt they are. But you're in the best place possible, and we're going to take care of you. Even though I don't remember the exchange, he says I nodded and again closed my eyes, shutting out the activity around me. Knowing he had to get an IV in my arm and, going to God, and hoping to God my veins hadn't collapsed with the loss of blood pressure, McNulty scolded an orderly who had started to remove the splint from my leg. Stop, McNulty shouted. I need to get the IV in before we release the leg from the splint. Otherwise, he knew I would continue to bleed out. After he successfully inserted the IV needle into my arm and the first units of replacement blood were safely coursing through my body, Dr. King came into the bay. When he saw me, he could see that my wound was exacerbating, losing so much blood so fast he could hear it gushing. He also realized that if he couldn't stop the bleeding within minutes, I'd be dead. King estimates, estimated that nearly my entire blood volume, every red blood cell I owned, had been left somewhere on Boylston Street or in the paddy wagon, and now in the ER. Because I was the closest patient to him in the trauma bay, he hurried over and quickly replaced the now slick and flimsy belt tourniquet with a proper locking CAT device. Moving with no-nonsense efficiency of a battlefield surgeon, King evaluated my obvious wounds and made sure the tourniquet was applied securely. Then he and McNulty turned me over so he could inspect my back. He wanted to make sure there, were no wound, there was no wound or internal bleeding that people had missed in the chaos. He knew those hidden injuries are snakes in the grass that often end up killing a patient because they go ignored for too long. While my back was clear of wounds and bruises as my clothes were cut away, they saw a troubling, a troubling blue contusion across my belly, which King didn't like the looks of at all. Because there was no open wound, he feared it might indicate internal damage or any number of organs, uh, to any number of organs, stomach, spleen, liver, or kidneys. 
He knew that my leg would my, he knew that my leg, now stabilized, getting into my abdominal cavity would be his first order of business. With a surgical plan in place, he ordered, ordered a chest x-ray, checked on the blood supply hanging above my gurney, and called ahead to the OR to say that he and I were on our way. It all took about 90 seconds. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, and with this chapter, I like it because every time I read it, it makes me think and realize that this was me, because I feel as if it was somebody else. I feel like I've had an out-of-body experience. The further I get away from the anniversary and what happened that day, it's, I don't even know what happened that day. I still don't know. I still wake up every morning. I don't sleep with my prosthesis on, so I wake up in the morning to put my leg on, which I'm sure most of you don't have to do first thing in the morning, <laughs> and say to myself, oh my gosh, I don't have a leg. Or I pass my reflection walking somewhere in the house or crutching to the bathroom at some point and think to myself, oh my God, I don't have a leg. So trying to read this and read it so many times, it really makes me understand what I went through from the beginning because obviously I wasn't coherent at that point. I was coherent for everything up until the paddy wagon doors opened, and then I decided it wasn't, I couldn't do anything more at that point. Keeping conscious was what was keeping me alive. When those doors opened, I knew that it was time for the doctors to do what they could. The first responders did what they could, I did what I could, and it was gonna be luck of the draw once I got there. So I like reading this. I also, when I was editing the book, and reading through, initially reading through Shores and Shana and Mike's parts too. Oddly enough, it was a it was like a, a page turner for me because we've talked about our different roles, so to say, and what happened that day, but we've never really gone into detail and we've never done it so that it's been sequential altogether. So in reading their parts, I felt like I would I I couldn't wait to finish their parts, because I, I wanted to know exactly what they did, like every second from, from when it went off to, to me getting to the hospital. So it was all new to me. And even so with the people that Jen Jordan spoke to. So she spoke with uh, Fran McNulty. And his comment about those little picture nails not sticking into uh, some of the victims really surprised me, because I guess I kind of wish that they put more of those nails in there and less BBs. But, you know, you think of these things that I was like, oh, okay, so they weren't just the BBs in there and they used these little nails, but they didn't work as well as some of the other shrapnel did. And I'm sure that most of the damage was done from the pressure cooker itself when it kind of ripped into different pieces, kind of acted as a, um, an axe of sorts as it was flying through the, year, through the air is, is what I can only imagine. But I, I guess, like in reading this, it, I just it, it makes me understand what what happened in a weird way and how many people had to help along the way. So I know that I focus, and it's the four of us in this particular book. But there's so many other people that helped me on Boylston Street that day, that helped me at Mass General that day in the week that I was there, and then the people that helped me at Spalding. And in a lot of cases, people that weren't even at those locations from all over the world who had reached out to us. One of the reasons why I wrote the book is to be able to do forums like this to say thank you for all the support, not just for me, but I know from the other survivors, and especially the other amputees, that we couldn't be where we are today, at least mentally, some people are still fighting physically, but we couldn't be where we are today without the support of everybody. And just having you here shows the support that you've had, not just for me, but for all of us. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, and I have to say, Dr. King is, is unbelievable. So if any of you ever have to have trauma, pray that he's your doctor. <laughs> it's kind of like having that pilot that landed the plane on the Hudson that if you were in a plane, you'd like to him to be your pilot. If it was going down, you'd want Dr. King to do his, his work uh, on you if, if you ever need that to happen. 
The other thing I'd like to address too is I, I know that what happened to us isn't the first time that there's been a terrorist attack in the United States. There's been others, as we all know, 9-11, which was a thousand million times worse. But it's going to continue. And I, I think these forums, and I, you know, I haven't really addressed this at the other ones, but because we've had so many recent ones in the last couple of weeks, that whatever I can do to pay it forward and offer my so-called expertise, and you know, I want people to be able to reach out to me. So just throwing this out there, but if anybody ever knows anybody that has an amputation for whatever reason or has been through some trauma and they need someone to speak to, I'm more than happy to be reached out to and, and spoken to and I can offer whatever advice I might have or just even be a shoulder and an ear to cry to and, and just listen because it is a tough time. One of the most important things for me was early on when a lot of other organizations came, such as we had several military groups, um, Semper Fi and America's Fund, come and show that even though you lose a leg, two legs, an arm, an eye, fingers, that life goes on and you can still have a good life. And they look normal. When they walked in on those prosthesis, one guy told me he could hop like he could hop on one leg for like a mile if he needed to, which I don't advise. I heard that's bad. Uh, so, but it, w it was truly encouraging to see them and it was extremely healing. The only part that wasn't healing that I w I'm gonna steal from Heather Abbott is that when one of those military gentlemen came in to visit her for the first time, her biggest question was if she was gonna ever be able to wear her heels. And BJ did not, he's like, I'm sorry, that's the one question. He's like, because he walked in, he said, ask me any question. She's like, okay, will I ever be able to wear my, my shoes, my, my four inch heels again? And he's like, yeah, that's the one question I can't answer. <laughs> but uh, we found those people that can answer those questions. However, I choose not to wear the four inches. I decide that uh, flats are the way to go with the prosthesis. So, uh, and then the other thing is, I mentioned about the knee joints, keep them. Cherish your knees because they're huge. It's, it, they're so important in life to get around. I, if anything, I don't even care that if I had half my leg, I just wish I had my knee, my knee joint. That's probably the only thing that I can say that if I look back at it and say, you know, if you had to change it, what would, you know, but you couldn't have your leg. I just want the knee joint. That's it. Um, although they don't have it easy, they have it easier because, um, yeah, you, you're, my knee's not attached to my brain, so obviously I never know where I'm putting my foot down, and that's always um, chancy of, of where it lands. And um, I remember when I first got out of the hospital and had gotten back to the North End, there were a couple fundraisers, and I was still on medication, but we'd all kind of, all my friends would all go out afterwards, and they were like, you know, are you gonna drink? Are you gonna have a cocktail? And I was like, no. I said, number one, I don't need a cocktail being on one leg and then being on medication and having a glass of wine. I'm like, I don't need to fall off a bar stool now. So uh, it took some time for me to uh, get rid of the medication and then have my first glass of wine. But it's, it's just one of those things that having that knee joint is, is really a huge, huge benefit. Um, even in weight of the prosthesis, my, my leg weighs like 10 pounds. And I won't lie, I get jealous when I see a below knee amputee out in public and they're walking around and they have like a, another leg in their backpack because my leg does not fit in a backpack. I have to ha use a lacrosse bag to lug my <laughs> legs around. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just crazy and I have four different legs. I have a regular walking leg that I use every day. I have a bike leg, I have a running leg which has been kind of put in the closet for a long time. Maybe she'll come out this, this spring. And, uh, and then I have a, a dress-up leg, which I don't, I don't like to wear because it's, it's even heavier than this leg that I have on, which is like eight or nine pounds. That one's at least 10 to 12 pounds. So, you know, I, I get jealous of, of the Bolognese people. And um, one of the other things I get, I, I uh, have to say, not jealous, I actually enjoy, is when I see um, one of you two-leggers trip and maybe fall. <laughs> 
apologize for that. But if one of you were to take a digger in here, I might laugh, and I'm so sorry. And actually, I shouldn't even say that I laugh. It's just I really appreciate it, because I hit the pavement every so often, and um, it happens to everybody, but I just, I think I'm more self-conscious, because I don't want someone to go, oh, you poor thing, you know, you have one leg, you fell. And I'm like, yeah, you probably fell yesterday. <laughs> so I do enjoy that, and I apologize for that out in the open. But um, yeah. Uh, and uh, at the beginning of this chapter, too, I was talking about my mom, how she always wanted a cigarette. I have a funny story. I have several funny stories about her and her cigarettes. But one of them in particular, I don't know, it was probably about 10 or 15 years ago, where she, I had been up late. I, I couldn't sleep one night, and I was watching infomercials. One of them came on about taking vitamins to quit smoking. So I'm like, this is great. Vitamins, what a healthy way to quit smoking. It's like 3 in the morning. I dial the 800 number. I order them. like, $100. I get them. I bring them to her. And I'm like, you know, just try them. Two weeks, three weeks go by. Because I don't want to hound her. She's one of those people, if you tell her, tell her, tell her, she's not going to do it. So about three weeks later, I said, you know, just out of curiosity, how are, how are they going? Did you try them? She goes, Roseanne. Did you read the ingredients on that? I'm not putting that in my body. <laughs> Even to this day, we were out to dinner uh, I don't know, within the last month or two, and one of my nieces, she's 15, she was drinking a Diet Coke, and my mother's like, that stuff will kill you. And I'm like, really? You know? And then I said, what about your cigarettes? And shut her right up. So we know what keeps her quiet, which is good. but. Uh, there's just so many stories about her that I could go on and on, but just the whole cigarette thing, it's just really who she is, and she's, she's crazy. But um, So I'll take some questions, answers, if anybody has questions that they'd like to ask. Yes? Sure, sure. First off, um, I've sworn to my parents that was the first and only time I've ever been in a paddy wagon. If it were back of a police car, I don't think I could say that. Well, I know I couldn't say that. But I definitely have never been in the back of a paddy wagon before. Um, so when Shores kind of came through the cloud of smoke and carried me to the middle of the street, I think because I had been taken away from where a lot of, like, Mark Fukuro was legitimately, like, right behind me. I think I was blown into him. Uh, the two Norton brothers were next to me. Sadly, Martin Richard wasn't far. Lindsay Liu was not far. Uh, Heather Abbott wasn't far. Adrian wasn't far. We were all kind of in, in that area. And uh, for whatever reason, Shores thought I had to get out of there. So he scooped me out, thinking that maybe another bomb would go off. My brain instantaneously knew I had lost my leg, although I never saw it. And it was still attached by threads. But I never saw her because it was kind of tucked under me. So he carries me to the middle of the street. Shana Catone, the police officer, she comes upon him <coughs> holding the tourniquet. And, um, another gentleman who we find out later was actually a doctor. He was helping um, keep me calm and holding my hand and making sure I was still alert. And as I was laying there, uh, you, could, you could hear the sirens coming and going, coming and going. And in my mind, I'm like, OK, every time I heard, I'm like, OK, here comes my morphine. Mm -hmm. They have morphine. Mm -hmm. Just keep, keep control until you get the morphine. Because I didn't want to freak out either. One of, my, one of the things that my mom said growing up was that uh, crying makes you ugly. In her defense, she meant that it gives you puffy eyes and a headache. <laughs> but as a kid, you hear, don't cry because it makes you ugly. So, of course, that's one of the first things that I think of after being blown up and, you know, hysteria is going on around you. I'm like, don't cry because I don't need to look any uglier than I look right now and stay calm. So uh, as I'm laying there, I'm staying calm and you hear the ambulances coming and going. And I could hear, even though the eardrums had been blown out, you could still hear some stuff. And especially Shana was like right by my head and the other gentleman was right by my head. And I could hear them talking about putting me... So they had uh, a few of the firefighters from Mike's house. He wasn't, hadn't come on scene yet, but uh, they were putting me on, getting me on a backboard, getting me ready to be transported, straightened my right leg out to put it in an air splint. And I have to tell you, I know I was in pain, but when they straightened my leg out, it was brutal, brutal, brutal. And at that point, I said to myself, God, 
I, even though I, the, this horse has left the barn, I will never have kids knowing this pain that I'm feeling right now. I'm like, this is gonna be what it's like to give childbirth. So I was like, yeah, forget that's never gonna happen. Um, and so they get me all boarded. And uh, sadly, one of the, the, the gentlemen that straightened my leg out is actually Mike Kennedy, who was in the Beacon Street fire and who perished. He was one of Mike's buddies in the house. So fortunately, I got to say thank you to him in person on a few occasions, and I have a very uh, funny memory of him, which I'm so appreciative of. But as they were getting me boarded and getting me ready to be transported, I hear this ambulance coming, and I hear them talking, and they're like, well, we can put her on the back of a gator, which is one of those little things you see on football fields or whatever. And I'm thinking, and I used them, I used them at the time at my rental properties for like the maintenance men to take trash barrels out and pull things. And I'm like, oh my God, they're gonna put me on the back of a gator? <laughs> and, um, and then I heard them talking about putting me in the back of a police car. And then I heard them talking about putting me in the back of a civilian car, but the backboard wouldn't fit. So the next thing I know, I hear the ambulance coming again. And I guess from my understanding is that it was just too full. The ambulances were taking three, four, five people at a time, and they're like, sorry, we're, we're too full. Another police officer, Jimmy Davis, who was on scene, he's like, I have my rig, my paddy wagon right around the corner. <laughs> he got it, pulled it up. They loaded me in, and um, they also loaded Mark Fuqua, Mark Fuqua roll in. And talking to Mike, he thinks that because it was so chaotic and not everybody was like thinking straight, and in those, in those moments, you're so absorbed in what you're doing and not understanding what everybody else is doing around you. Mike thinks that they were gonna just like load us into the back of the paddy wagon, shut the doors and have it take off. Now, for most of you, I have to assume you've never been in the back of a paddy wagon, as I had never been. Uh, there's no seat belts. It's a metal bench back there. So there's no way to secure those backboards on, on there. So when Mike got in there, he's like, I have to go with her. So basically, he's kneeling on this tin floor, trying to keep the backboard on the bench. There's another gentleman, another firefighter, leaning up against Mark and his backboard on the opposite side. So Mar Mike's legs and this other gentleman's legs are kind of like locked. I have to assume their knees were painful because of the, the type of floor. And then when you shut the paddy wagon doors, there's no windows, there's no ventilation. God only knows what the smell was like before Mark and I got put in there. And then we get put in there with our burnt hair and our burnt skin. Mike says it was disgusting. And I can only imagine um, how bad it was. So uh, Mike says one of my first questions or one of my first statements when they put me in there and they shut the door, I'm like, so I guess this isn't an ambulance. And he's like, yeah, no, it's not an ambulance. And I was like, okay, no morphine. All right. It's not an ambulance. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and then I, I, you know, had requested to go to Mass General, but I was told first available, and, and for whatever reason, there's so, many, there's so many things that I can say of why I feel lucky. I have to say that I'm completely lucky that it, it was the back of a paddy wagon, even though I didn't have the morphine, because all the other ambulances were pretty much going to the other hospitals, and there was a high chance that I could have gone to Beth Israel or Brigham and Women's um, or Boston Medical, which are all phenomenal, phenomenal hospitals, and I would have gotten exceptional care there as well, but my primary care is at Mass General, and in my mind, I wanted her to know where I was, and I knew she would know that I was there. I also knew that my family, if they hadn't heard from me, which I was able to get my sister's telephone number to one of my girlfriends who came upon me, um, so I was able to notify them, but if I hadn't been able to notify them, I know that that's where my mom would have gone first. She's like Mass General all the way. So she would have known right that, that and as a matter of fact, she told my sister, she's like, I know she's at Mass General, even before they even knew where I was. So in my mind, along the way, I'm calculating the route to, to the hospital. I'm like, are we on Starrow Drive? Like, where are, you know, I'm kind of going through the, I can feel the van left, you know, making its turns because I'm sliding with it. Poor Mike is trying to keep himself steady, hold the backboard on the bench, position himself on the wall, hold the tourniquet, and then you have me like banging his chest with a bloody burned hand, chest with the, the, the hand asking him to hold my hand. And he's like, I don't want to touch that. You know, he didn't have gloves on. He didn't have time to put gloves on. So it's just a whole interesting uh, chain of events. And, you know, obviously looking back now, there's a lot of comical moments in it. And, you know, that's how I have to look at it. I,
feel as though that there is a lot of funny things out of it. And it was a serious moment, but it's, 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 it, it's a funny moment too. So um, trying to make it best as possible. Any other questions? Yes. Well, first of all, I find it amazing that you um, were coherent and everything when you were on your way to the hospital and that you have such an incredible sense of humor. And I think Thank that's you. fantastic. That's great. Um, and then the second question I, well, uh, question I have is, have you set a date for your <laughs> Um, they, I know you said kind of like fallish or something. Yes, yeah. thank you for your thank you for your kind words. I mean, just trying to do what I think anybody else would do in my shoes, right. Right. and um, and yes, October twenty first. Oh, good. We set a date. Yeah. Thank you. Now we're just working on the details. There's a lot of details that go into it. It's a small wedding, though, right? Small. Yeah. <laughs> don't even go there. Since, since don't even go. Started, right? Oh, don't even go there. Yeah. That, well, We'll get, we'll yeah. work through all the problems yeah. with that. Yeah, the guest list. That's, yeah, thank you. We're, we're very excited. Yeah. So we just want it to be fun, and it's going to be. Yeah. So. location? Yes, okay. it's going to be down the Cape. Okay. So we're very excited, okay. very excited. Yes? You were talking about reading the other three's recollections of what was going on. What was the biggest wow moment for you when you read through their memories and said, oh, my gosh, Uh, I would say, I think really with Shores, because, you know, I knew he was a college student. Well, I didn't know he was a college student at the time, but uh, the, it, it, it's, it's all interesting. And I, I guess there were a lot of wow moments, so it's hard to really pick one. As I mentioned, in those situations, everybody's got tunnel vision. Everybody has tunnel vision. And so there were two other um, gentlemen who were probably in their 30s, have some sort of medical background in a sense, but they're the ones that took their belt off and handed it and helped Shores put the, tour had put, helped put the tourniquet on me and, and handed it over to Shores. They thought Shores was a doctor. They had no idea. So when the police officer came through and was like, you, you know, if you're not medical, you need to leave. But here's Shores. This, at the time, I think he was 19, holding the tourniquet. He's like, I can't leave. Like, I'm not a medical person, but I, I can't let go of this either. So I think really just, um, you know, knowing the different people going through this. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the, it's not so much reading the chapters, but for the longest time, the doctor that was on my left, we thought he was a physician's assistant. We were searching high and low for a physician's assistant because I felt as though that I needed to meet anybody and everybody that helped me that day so that I could personally say thank you to them and reach out in some way. He never came forward. It took us three years. I think we just found him basically last year, and he was a doctor. Um, so and it, it, it's all coincidental on how we found him. I think there's, there's so many weird things. Like There's so many small world scenarios. Shores was at a lecture at Northeastern. This gentleman happened to give the lecture. They had lunch at this lecture. The gentleman giving the lecture happened to sit next to Shores. Shores looks at him and goes, I feel like that's the doctor or the guy. And so Shores, um, Shores you know, talked to him a little bit or whatever. And then ironically, the four of us plus Jen Jordan, the ghostwriter, like a week later, she was in town from Utah, and we had all gotten together and we were having dinner, and Shores tells us this story. We um, Google a picture of the gentleman helping on the street, and Shores is like, I'm pretty sure that's him. So Shores, for whatever reason, had this, this person's email. The next day, sends him an email. Lo and behold, it was that gentleman. And I mean, there's just a lot of like little coincidences along the way that have transpired over the course of time. Uh, so it's just been really interesting on these little nuances that you come across and find out. And I basically, and then the two, the two gentlemen that gave Shores the belt, early on they had sent me a Facebook page, uh, message. 
And there were a lot of instances of where people were saying that they did certain things. And, and so, and you know, what, why people would lie about it, I'm really not sure. Uh, but I, I thought one of these kids, one of these guys was trying to say that he was Shores because I was looking for Shores. It took me two weeks to find Shores. It had been out in the media that I was looking for this person. So I'm like, oh, this kid's trying to impersonate and say he's Shores, it's not. But as time went on and trying to put everything together, I sent him a Facebook message back and said, you know, I apologize. And lo and behold, come to find out, you know, they are the ones that saw Shores carrying me, said, you need to put her down. And I had just told Shores that I was going to pass out and you need to put me down. And that they had, they had helped out and that it was his belt, not Shores' belt, as so many people thought. So there's like so many little pieces of it that, uh, so many little details that are just truly amazing. Anyone else? Yes. You've talked a lot about the, the physical events. What about the emotional and the, the mental? How does one recover from that traumatic situation? It's, a, it's, it's an individual journey for each person that goes through something like this. I can only speak to what has helped me and suggest what I did. In this particular situation, we were kind of thrust into the public spotlight right from the beginning. I think that you could have chosen, well, you could have chosen one or two ways, to not accept and put yourself out there or to put yourself out there. I think because I did a lot of the media, a lot of the interviews, it allowed me to really talk about it. I've done some therapy. I did, the, I did most of the therapy upon the, set, the first year anniversary because I wasn't sure how I was going to handle it. I didn't know how I was going to deal with a lot of it. So I decided to put myself in and talk to someone about it and just kind of get me through that time frame and see if I really needed to talk to somebody about it. Uh, I think you have to be your own advocate and seek out the help, but not a lot of people can do that or not a lot of people want to do that. And I think it comes down to, for me, I had a good life before and I wanted to continue to have that good life. So I needed to do and take certain steps that would allow me to have that. And part of it was trying to get right back up and doing the things that I used to do. Or even though it was considered very early on, I mentioned that uh, I had tried running, and I put myself right in, and a lot of people said, it's too early, it's too soon, and you know what, maybe it was, but it was something that I needed to see if I could do it. I needed to, and again, our situation was different because of it being such a public scenario. We were given a lot of opportunities that not a lot of people, when they're amputated, get, if any people get. We had so many different organizations that came to us rather than us having to try to find them. And if I can put people into, um, touch, in touch with them along the way, oh, you know, going forward, I'm so happy to do so and help them get into these different organizations because the Challenge Athletes Foundation reached out to um, us early, early on, and they've been able to, uh, they grant, whether it's lessons, prosthesis, other types of equipment to try to get back to doing what you used to do or to try something that new that you've never done. They, I applied for a grant and they got me my bike leg. So honestly, I hated spin class before. You, I tried it once with one of my good friends and I was like, this is for the birds, I'll never, and this was like probably 15, 20 years ago. I'm like, I'm never doing this again. And now, you know what, that's one of my better activities because it doesn't put a lot of pressure on my limb. So it's, it's, it's really trying to work yourself through it. I think with the interviews, I spoke about it a lot. It's still very foreign to say that I was blown up. Uh, that excuse only goes so far, too. I try to use it every so often. And <laughs> gets me, doesn't get me anywhere these days. And I think really just maybe having a sense of humor of what happened because you, you have your choice. You can sit on the couch and eat chocolates all day, which I do on occasion. And then the next day I get up and, and battle, battle whatever challenges. Last summer I was meeting somebody for lunch in the North End and I was walking to meet that person because everything pretty much in the North End is walking. And I was wearing a skirt. For whatever reason, the shoes that I had on and the way I was walking, the tip of my 
uh, right foot hit like a cobblestone that was protruding, and I went straight down. Thank God I had good underwear on, because I'm sure whoever's behind me got a good show, got a good flash. Um, but I basically fell down, I bounced back up, and a gentleman across the street, of course, because it was lunchtime, and at Neptune Oyster, there's like a line down the street starting at 11, right? So I'm like, of course, I have to fall in the North End lunchtime on Salem Street in front of Neptune, Neptune Oyster. But he's like, are you all right? I'm like, yep, I'm fine. Later that evening, there was something going on in the North End. I texted one of my girlfriends. I said, are you going to this? She's like, yes, do you want to go? And I was like, you know, you know what, Alyssa? I'm not feeling very confident. I fell earlier today, and my ego's been shot a bit. So I think I'm going to sit this one out. But you know, maybe tomorrow's a different day. We'll see where I'm at. Honestly, the next day, I didn't even think of it. Yeah. Totally. So you kind of have to put those, take those moments you know, I think I, I think I mourned the loss of my leg in a, in a way at some point. There have been times that I've walked out the door going, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to lug this thing around. It, you know, people look at you funny or, you know, there's times I feel sub, like um, uh, self-conscious about it. We were just down in South Carolina for something and there was a restaurant that we were looking for and it wasn't where we were supposed to be. And Mike was like, well, let's just go in and check it out. And I'm like, I don't really want to get out of the car because I was in shorts. And I was like, you know, I don't want these people to see my leg. And I just don't want them, you know, and, and but I, you have to kind of push through that and say, what are you going to do? Sit in the car all night? I was starving. I like food. I like food too much. So I was like, I got to go in. So um, I, it's a battle. Some people can't do it. And I, and I completely get that. I completely understand. But I think you have to look back at, it, life of what you had prior and where do you want to be and where do you want to go. So I tried skiing. I used to ski. Uh, I mean, not a good skier. I'm really good at the upray skiing part of it <laughs> and I always felt that I needed to do a run or two. And, um, and so I tried getting back to skiing that first year and I cried. I go out on the mountain. I was with the Disabled Sports USA. 800 amputees of, or disabled person of some form and here I am crying because I'm like below, I'm above the knee trying to ski one-legged. And you've got a gentleman who's bilateral, double below the knee amputee snowboarding. And I'm like, how can I complain? I can't complain. You know, I, I have one really good leg. So, you know, you kind of have to put things in perspective, but you have to give yourself time to put it in perspective. I mean, there's been plenty of times that I've cried and been miserable and, and then just kind of move on the next day. Any other questions? Yes. Have you ever been at the finish line or any part of Boston Marathon since that day? Yes. Right. The um, marathon in 2014, I said to myself that if I didn't go back that day for the, the next one, that I probably would never go back. And that it would be a challenge every year and probably harder every year to get myself back there. It was my favorite day in the city. I don't know if it will ever be my favorite day in the city again. I actually highly doubt it. But I'm getting it back to a place where I do enjoy it. And I'm doing very um, a lot of the similar things that I've done in the past. But I've done it in increments. 2014, I invited myself to Spalding's party at the Mandarin, which is the right way to go because it's all free food and free drinks. <laughs> um, and so what I did was I went in through the Prudential in the park. I almost didn't go. My brother-in-law, my sister, I had my brother-in-law, my sister, my three nieces, Mike, Shane, and Shores, Shane's girlfriend. We were all together. And I, my, my brother-in-law and my sister and nieces came to pick me up, and I almost didn't want to get in the car. I was almost like, you know what? Forget it. This is not worth it. And I, I fought through it. I got in the car, and we went. But we went into in the Prudential. We went into the garage. We came up through the Prudential, went into the Mandarin. I was never out on the street, so I wasn't in that atmosphere where I really felt vulnerable. I watched it behind a, a glass window. I had a team. Of, the other thing is I had a team of friend, 10 friends and, and relatives running for me, and they fundraised for me. And so in my heart, I was like, there's no way I can't be here to cheer them on. Even if I'm not on the sideline, they need to know that I've been here waiting for them. And I saw everyone except for one cross, come down Boylston Street. But it was like watching a TV because I was behind a window. You could see the crowd and everything, but I knew I was safe. 2015, I, um, what did I do 2015? Oh, I went to, um, 2015 was the year that it rained, I believe, that it poured. And I had given 
a gentleman who had been supporting me. I'd never met him before, but he had been in the same industry that I was, had heard I was injured, got in touch with me initially. He's a volunteer for the Challenge Athletes Foundation. He's a two-legger, so he, but he does a lot of running. He does a lot of triathlons, and he, he's become a huge support system for, for me. And uh, I gave him a bib, a marathon bib to run, and he said, I'll run, but you have to run the last half mile with me. And I was like, yeah, well, yeah, I don't know. We'll talk about that. You know, and I'm like, we'll talk about it when you come up Hereford, and then we see where we're at. <laughs> like, it wasn't like we're going to talk about it the week before or the month before. It's like it's going to be a game time decision. And sometimes I don't really think things through. Sometimes I just do, and maybe that's part of my healing process is I just don't focus on it. I don't think about it. And I just ended up being at that spot with my running leg on, and it was pouring rain, it was miserable. There weren't as many people on the sidelines because it was the worst weather ever. I think it's the worst marathon weather I ever remember. And it was raining, and I was in the middle of the street where the safest place to be. It was the sidelines that everybody was critically injured, was the spectators. The runners were the safe ones. They might have gotten shrapnel, they might have lost some herring, but they were truly safe um, being in the middle of the street. So. I knew jumping into the crowd and cutting down Boylston Street that I was going to be safe. 2016, I, um, I, I, don't, know, I don't remember what I did 2016, but I was more, oh, I went to like um, Greg Hill Foundation, who's been a, um, Greg Hill is a radio DJ in Boston. He has a foundation and he's phenomenal with any sort of tragedy within the New England area or Massachusetts that he raises funds for them, and he was one of the first people that stepped up. Um, I remember I was, I think at Mass General still, in that first week, and my sister said that my cousin reached out to her and said that Greg Hill Foundation is gonna come and give you a check. And I was like, oh my God, why? Like, what do I need a check for? And I'm like, am I gonna have to pay him back? You know, like, that was my thought. I'm like, how am I gonna pay this guy, this person back? Like, I, I mean, I knew who he was, but pay him back, you know, and so, Come to find out, he does all this fundraising, and he's, he's amazing, and he has a party at, um, at uh, Capitol Grill. So basically, I was across the street from the firehouse, so I knew I was safe with all the firemen there. I was inside with all these other people. Shores was with me, and you have to be safe if Shores is with you. I mean, he's like the lucky charm, that kid. I mean, he's amazing. He's amazing. So, um, yeah, it just, so I've gone back. And this past year, uh, I actually stood outside along the race route in front of the Mandarin. Shores ran with a bib that I gave him for the Heather Abbott Foundation, because Heather Abbott has started her own foundation to gift back uh, prosthesis to people who need it because they're so expensive and uh, you need multiple. And in, uh, in health insurance says that you need one, basically, to get you around in life. It doesn't matter if you ran before, it doesn't matter if you hiked before, you get one. And you know, quite honestly, you need a water leg, you need a running leg, you need a biking leg. If you are active, you need all these. And the cheapest one is probably 10 grand. The one I have on is 100,000. They last three to five years. So she started her own, she started a foundation, she's doing phenomenal work, and Shores ran for her. So I stood outside, waited for him, but I was with Mike, I was with um, all of his family. I was with the Heather Abbott Foundation. I, my, a lot of my family was there. And uh, so it's slowly, slowly getting back there. We're working on it.